I welcome Dr. Yossi that uh, he joined us today for uh, this webinar and uh, this Center of Medical Informatics and Healthcare, uh, which is actually associated with the Department of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics. And uh, this is uh, the second webinar in series. First was by our Honorable Vice Chancellor and uh, the second is by now Professor Yossi and the coincidences both are from the same area that is biomedical and uh, related fields. So uh, this is just I would like to before uh, Dr. Yossi begin uh, with his uh, uh, webinar, I would like to tell you within two minutes about the brief of this department. Uh, this department of biotechnology and bioinformatics was uh, established in the year 2002 and we have uh, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate and uh, PhD programs in the department in the field of biotechnology and bioinformatics which is like BTEC, MTEC, MSc and the doctor, doctoral programs and also we uh, like uh, have our postdoctorate student also can join this department. Uh, this department is having uh, research in various areas whether you talk about uh, environment or infectious diseases or uh, bioinformatics, drug delivery, healthcare, uh, plant tissue culture, animal tissue culture. So there's a versatility among the 17 faculty members that we have in the department and a very strong network of uh, our scholars, BTEC and MTEC students. So uh, this department uh, is giving a lot of various courses and also give uh, freedom to the students to choose their electives. And I could see uh, the Professor Yossi's seminars today in that direction that if the people feel that this uh, field is an interesting one, so they can choose the electives, they can choose or their research area in this particular field. And you might have seen if the center website, in this center website, there are faculty members from all across the departments, whether it is biotechnology and bioinformatics, electronics also, physics and material science also. So we strongly believe in the interdisciplinary research projects and a teamwork from all the departments of GUIT and also from the other institutes. So uh, I, with these, this introduction again, I would like to request uh, Dr. Tirath and Dr. Ragini that they can uh, carry over with this uh, seminar and very warm welcome to Dr. Yossi that uh, he is today with us with a very good topic and uh, uh, with his research work. Thank you so much and welcome again. Thank you very much, sir. For your informative words. Now I would like to tell you that uh, we are having a wonderful response from all over the world and in this uh, I can see more than 100 participants and many international participants are already there in the list. Sylvia is there and many others are there because we have got registration from Canada, USA, Poland, Ukraine, Hong Kong, Bhutan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Philippines, Pakistan, Nepal, Algeria, Amman, Nigeria as well as some other countries. So it's a very good response from all over the world. And now uh, I would like to tell you uh, that this center is starving for the excellence, not only in research and academics, but we are organizing workshop at national level. We will plan an international workshop in the near future. We are having this international webinar series and we are planning to have various other activities, various uh, research activities are also going under this, under the ages of this center because we are having hybrid uh, BTEC and PhD works under the ages of Center of Excellence. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Ragini to introduce you first about uh, UC's excellent profile and then we can have his talk. So good, so good morning. morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Today I Dr. Ragini Rasing from Department of Physics and Material Science, JP University. Welcome one and all for the second and very important talk of this international webinar series. Today's talk will be delivered by Professor Yoshi Shekham Diamond. We are pleased to welcome Professor Yoshi from Tel Aviv University, Israel. It is my privilege and enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Yoshi Shekham. He has many credentials in his credit and having a very long and rich experience in teaching and research. His research is in the field of micro and nano electronic science and technology specifically electrolysis plating of metals and alloys 
interconnect technology for ulsi circuits and flexible electronics and electrochemical biosensors for the food medical and agro applications presently professor yoshi shekham diamond is the bernard l schwartz chair for nanoscale information technologies in department of electrical engineering physical electronics and the department of material science and technology faculty of engineering tel aviv university he is also a visiting professor cnr imm rome italy and waseda university tokyo japan a distinguished international chair professor fengchia university taichung taiwan and dot chair professor and director of the tau tiet food security center of excellence he served in many academic positions including being the academic director micro technologies laboratory director university research institute for nano science and nano technology head of the department of physical electronics vice dean of the faculty of engineering for industrial relations and with the friends of the faculty in israel and abroad he is on the university board of governors in university patent committee head of the industrial affiliation program faculty of engineering and a member of the board of directors of ramoth that is the technology transform arm of tel aviv university he is a member of the magnet committee promoting basic and generic technologies in israel the innovation authority ministry of trade and industry he has published more than 260 journal papers more than 400 conference papers in registered proceedings he has 33 patents to his credit seven chapters in books he edited two conference proceeding books and two books separately i just gave the short introduction as he has done so much that is very difficult to say in this short time now i would like to invite professor yoshi to deliver his talk today he will be sharing with us his expert opinion on the very essential topic that is flexible sensors for biomedical applications with that i ask you all to give full attention to dr yoshi and helping me in welcoming him for today's talk i am sure this talk will be advantageous and informative for all the participants so before the start of the talk some important announcements for the participants write your queries in the chat box your queries will be answered at the end of the presentation i request all participants to make sure that your microphones are mute the feedback link for the e certificates will be provided at the end of the talk write your name and affiliation in the form as you want on the certificate so now i request professor yoshi to please begin his very important and imperative talks for the participants and for all of us thank you very much ragini am i audible yeah good so i'm switching to opening the screen the second uh, can you see my screen not now can you see my screen no. now no is it okay yeah good so today i will talk about flexible sensors for biomedical applications and ragini um i'm switching for the next slide is it okay does it can can you see the presentation is it okay yes good okay so ragini saved me time to see all my credentials but i'm also uh, since last year also an uh, endowed chair professor in tapar institute of engineering and technology so i would say until last march i used to be there every month and even visit uh, uh, shimla and jp university which uh, i you did not mention but we have a memorandum of, of memorandum of, of understanding with uh, with you so i hope to see you soon again i uh, i really like to visit india this is my second home now and uh, as you can see from my credentials i am from the school of electrical engineering which means i'm electrical engineer i work on developing technologies so i develop technologies for many applications including microprocessors and sensors but today i will focus on our work on biomedical microsystem technology flexible and i will answer why flexible i'll give you some examples uh, in the second part of the talk i will mention some work on what materials people use for biomedical applications 
I will speak a little bit about agriculture and food because in the last three years, I found out that many technologies for which people use for biomedical applications can also be used for agriculture and food, especially uh, flexible electrodes for uh, ag agro application and post harvesting applications. I will, men I, will, I will not cover all electrode fabrication methods because this can be just uh, the whole semester. I will just tell you about few new technologies, which is laser processing and nanoparticle uh, supersonic cluster beam deposition that we collaborate with the University of Milano with Professor Paolo Milani, and some conclusions. So this is the content for today. And without further introduction, let's ask why, what are biomedical flexible sensors, which are practically uh, mainly non-invasive, although some more work is being done on invasives that can detect disease or symptoms of disease by detecting the composition, deficiency, or abundance of specific constituents in the subject of interest like skin, saliva, blood, pressure, tear, urine, neural activity, and more. So practically, I work on the field, and in my lab, we make uh, electrodes, for example, and we make sensors for more than 20 years, and we are interested in all sorts of materials. And the key problem, I'm going to show you today the key problem. It, it, they're relatively simple devices. We just have a piece of, a little bit of metal on plastic, and you can think this is it. The problem is that nothing is simple in science and technology. And we talk about signals from the body, and I took it from a beautiful review that was published recently in 2020 on flexible inorganic bioelectronics. You, can, you talk about electrophysiological signals, you talk about physical signals, you talk about biochemical signals. You also have a photoelectric signal, uh, like for example, all this PPG in blood oxygen, blood pressure. And you have all this, you can see a long list of possible signals. And each one of them, you need to tailor the specific electrode, the specific sensor. So when we talk about biomedical applications, and you can see to the right, you are, have, you, you are following a certain physiological parameter, for example, on the hand, on the, on the head, or any other part of the body. And today we talk also, we talk on signals, but we also talk on actuation, like for example, monitoring drug delivery uh, do some electrical stimulation, and also maybe some therapy and computing. And of course, you want to transfer it to a computer and to do some, today is very sexy to do artificial intelligence, deep learning, all this. Uh, but you want to do analytics on the data. You want to analyze the data. And in order to analyze the data, you need a lot of data. And flexible sensors are on the body. And why flexible? And this is like, for example, I took it from the same review, a schematic illustration of flexible inorganic electronic devices that, that are intimately integrated with human tissue for EP signals measuring. For example, EEG, ECOG, ECG, and EMG. And you can think, you can see about it. You can do ECG, put the electrodes here for the ECG for sensing uh, the the um, EMG, the electromyograph, you can put it over the, over the shoulder here, or if you want to do EOG or ECOG or ECG on the brain. And the flexible, these are the signals that people measure. And the advantage of flexible, you can see immediately. A flexible, they can, con they can sit what we say conformally on the skin or on the body. Conformally means sensor, takes the shape of the body. So the key in flexible sensors is can we make them as conformal as possible? And I'm going to show you later, there is some problem in, if the sensor is too much conformal, there is some problem. It's that you need, like in any uh, engineering problem, you always have some compromise. So what are the challenges in the strategies? And they were summarized so nicely in this paper. 
you have the compatibility. If you look at the, if you make sensors, the challenges for, and strategies for flexible stretchable devices on human body, you have the mechanical issue. You want stretchability, comfort contact. For example, if you are using a wearable and you are an athlete and you're using to monitor your body and you're running a marathon, you need it for four hours to sit nice in your body. You don't want it to scratch or itch or even cause some problem. You have skin-like stress strain behavior and the strategy here, for example, to stretchability, you do structural geometry design. Comfort, you make it very, very thin and microstructure soft, make it small. And skin-like device, you are limiting the strain, you do use a strain limiting substrate. The other aspect is the biology. For example, being breathable, for example, using textile, micropores, nanofiber, mesh membrane-based substrate, you want to be biodegradable tunable, degradable substrate and bio-resorbable functional materials. No rejection. You want inhibition of bacteria, for example. We use silver. We started to use it 20 years ago. I think even Ragini was a familiar part of our effort to deposit silver as an antibacterial material. Uh, encapsulation with very compatible material like PDMAs, hydrogel and silk protein, nanoparticle, nanowire based substrates. The other issue is thermal and thermal management. Uh, when you, you need some thermal conductivity substrates or heat sinks, so they're the type of thing. So, again, why flexible? And you can see everybody talk about flexible telephones and flexible electronics. First, the other advantage of being flexible is robust does not break. I mean, you can have other problems, but if it falls on the ground, it doesn't break. You can fold it, can be adjusted. Also, also usually lighter, because most of the polymers, their specific gravity is less than metals. And also can be environmental friendly using green materials. And this is a very important issue, because if we are successful in microelectronics, we're using billions of devices, and the waste is, is a big issue later. So again, why flexible? And we talk today about flexible sensors. The whole field of flexible electronics is a very big field. But we talk today about flexible sensors only, which are mechanically compatible from hardness and robustness. They're biocompatible, for example, using carbon-based substrates, chemically compatible. You want to functionalize them using organic chemistry. So we have, we can do since we are using organic-based or silico-organic-based materials, we can do a lot of chemical modifications to the substrate, make them compatible, make them conducting, making a, doing a lot of things. We talk about a, a specific section on the flexible sensors are wearable. By the way, not every flexible sensor is wearable, but wearable is a very important section on the skin, for example. It's I took from one of the recent papers, you make a whole device, attach it to the screen. This is an electrode array and wireless de uh, device. Also implanted devices. <laughs> and the implanted can be very large, relative, a few millimeters or a few centimeters. Also, for example, very small. This is a paper that published recently when people uh, insert carbon nanotube sensor inside a target tumor. So this is also a flexible sensor made of carbon nanotube. Then actually pick up a signal from the tumor. I will not go into detail. This was published very recently. So if you look at the landscape of all future electronics, you have the classical electronics. You have the transparent electronic. This is for display. But the transparent electronic, we can also make it stretchable, flexible, and for example, textile. And we can use it for biomedical applications. But you can see from this overlap that the same technology that people develop for display sometimes can be used for biomedical applications or vice versa. And this is what we do in my group. We develop technologies and sometimes we use it for biomedical applications, or I would say most of the time. But sometimes we also use them for displays and sometimes for electronic circuits. And the advantage is that we can put the electronics with the biomedical device on, on the same structure. Now, the next generation flexible electronic systems and the key relevant sectors, this I took from a, a relatively older review from 2012 of Professor Nathan, 
Professor Rocky Nathan, and this was published in IEEE about uh, eight years ago. If you talk a whole flexible system, the materials, nanowires, nanotubes, graphene, silicon, silver, etc., everything I mentioned before, and people use it for display, using for energy storage, for textiles, for human interactivity. And today I will focus on the healthcare. But as you can see, all, everything is related, which means if you are developing, my advice to you is based on my experience, if you work on developing flexible devices for biomedical engineering, or you please read papers also on displays and textiles. There's a lot of other relevant information coming from different, completely different disciplines. And the wearable sensor is, I would say, the more sexy regime people are talking about. Even I cannot see me, but even I have a wearable watch connected to my cell phone, which can measure temperature, pulse rate, position, motion, hydration, still not gas and pressure, but glucose is the next generation, and you can put it on the body. And why? It's, I think it's pretty obvious. All of you which are in the biomedical field, a very important issue is for the elderly, is uh, the aging society. If you look at uh, Europe, Japan, uh, countries which have uh, relatively the society growing older, you need to have sensors uh, to monitor because uh, early detection of problems can save a lot of uh, trouble from the person uh, for preventing medicine, for identifying problem. And you want it also, the other aspect we discuss is you, we want to make it compatible with all these communication technologies because we make all these sensors, but we want to transfer them through the internet, to the clinician, to ambulance, family. And we, when we develop sensors, we have to remember it's a part of a system. It's not just the sensor. And we have to bear in mind that we don't want, let's say, the, we don't want to develop a sensor and find after two years of work that it's very difficult to connect it to the internet. Sometimes it's not, there's no choice, but also for young people or the young in their spirit, you know, runner, you can measure, for example, you want to measure a physiological signal, transfer them. People talk about remote medicine. I mean, you can put the sensor, the physician can see you and he can see him using virtual reality. And today, uh, when I have to tell you from my personal experience today, after all this issue of the COVID-19 virus, in my country, in Israel, a lot of the physician visits are virtual now. And uh, there is a very strong need and the company and the local healthcare companies are starting to bring more technology. For all, I don't have need to explain to you what, uh, if you can solve problems remotely without personal interaction, especially for the elderly, if they, you don't want to, them to go to the hospital or to emergency room, you want them to be isolated. A lot of parameters you can do using uh, all this technology. And the key is sensor. At the end of the day, if you don't have a sensor, everything doesn't matter. You can have the best interconnect, the best internet, but if you don't have the sensor, you are doomed. For the skin, mouse, prosthetic and implants, your healthcare, uh, you use this all this uh, motion recognition, knee motion, voice, uh, pulse, uh, one healing monitoring, breath monitoring, prosthetic monitoring, human machine interface. And again, I stress, all of this is connected to the computer, connected to some sensor. You need, all, it's, that's why I put here with, you have the healthcare issue, but also AI and human activity monitoring. Everything is important. Another very good paper that was published two years ago talk about the physiological biosignals in the human body and corresponding healthcare sensors. We use the interactive systems. If you are making a flexible sensor, they can interact. They can actually be part of the interaction. So you can take physiological signal during motion, measure pressure, motion, tactile. You can get thermal signal. You can make electrophysiological signal and everything you can transfer to remote clinical device and you can do self-diagnostic. 
you can even th think of a lot of the things you can use AI, some deep learning mechanism to identify problems, and the home healthcare in the future, we anticipate some of it to be, uh, if, uh, of course, they always we need physicians and personal contact is important, but many problems can be solved using this. So if you look at the morphological control of micro nanostructure sensing materials, and I took it from the same paper, first you'll talk about dimensions, dimensional materials, like nanoparticles, nanowires, nanosheets, and nanopores. And there are one, zero dimension, one dimension, two dimension, 3D materials. And from the bio, biomimetic structure, you can make materials which are whisker-inspired, spider crack, crack uh, spiders crack inspired, the skin inspired, hierarch, uh, hierarch, hierarch, hierarchical structures. So when I'm, uh, next I'm going to talk a little about, about materials. And one of the advantages of using flexible materials is that we can shape them in very, very interesting structures and we can integrate them with a lot of materials. Now typical sensors, and again I use this wonderful paper, uh, saves me a lot of time uh, when I make when I present this to my students. What are the mechanisms for flexible devices? For example, you can use resistivity, and I'm going to show you materials. Uh, and this is, for example, you take an elastomer, PDMS, polydimethylsiloxane with carbon nanotubes. My group, we mix it with gold nanoparticles. But the idea, you make a conductor mixed with an insulator. And when you apply pressure, they change the shape. And when they change the shape, they change the resistivity. So you can use resistivity monitoring, or you can put them between electrodes and measure the capacitance, and change in capacitance give you indication on the change of position. You can use piezoelectric materials. We also use in my group here, the, this paper they present zinc oxide. My group, we use organic uh, piezo materials like a poly a PVDF, uh, similar materials, but it's the same principle. And, and another material which is recently has a lot of publications is triboelectricity, which means, uh, you know, the tribology is the science of friction. It's because of friction, you are generating electricity. So this will allow you to identify lateral forces and shear forces. So with all these sensors, we can identify pressure, motion, friction, uh, position, etc. So, for example, I'll give you a few examples before we go to my what we do. Uh, for example, this is a recent publication on a stretchable hybrid materials, and they mention all sorts of possibilities. You can make metal nanoparticles and nanowires inside the polymer, or carbon nanomaterials inside the polymer matrix, or conducting polymers. Uh, like polypyrrole, polyaniline, PDM, uh, uh, PDOT, and similar materials, and sometimes mix them with the nanoparticles. And recently, and I have to tell you that I'm following these papers, which is a very new topic, it's called liquid metals. Metals, there are some metals, like gallium and gallium alloys, which are liquid at room temperature. And you can integrate them on, elect on polymers. And you can make a beautiful contact because this is a liquid. And the liquid is absolutely conformal, can take the shape of the structures. And you can ask, how do I monitor the shape? So you can encapsulate it and bring it in contact with what you want to do. You just have to make sure that it will be con confined. So you can look at the stretchable hybrid materials, or you can look at geometry. For example, if you want, if you want to make something flexible in the in the x direction, you make it instead of a straight line, you make it like a serpentine. Or this is some serpentines. Or you can make it with wrinkles. If you make it wrinkled and crumples, then the material can bend easier. You can make a nano mesh or a mesh structure. So if you break some wires, they still have conduction. Or uh, you make it porous structures. So this can bend because it's uh, very flexible. So 
all these strategies of making hybrid materials or change, uh, making some geometry design or a combination, people use them. And there's a lot of papers on this. And every combination has advantage and disadvantage. And I think that there is not going to be one winner. There are going to be many possibilities. OK, so materials in processes. We talk about polymers. So when we talk about uh, sensors, we talk about substrates. Substrate is what we may, what the sensor is on a substrate, can be a polymer. And a polymer can be hard, like polyimide, nylon, or similar, or elastomer, like polydimethylsiloxane, which are PDMS, which is software or similar materials. Or other, like photodefinable polymers, ionic polymers, paper, fabric. And I'll talk a little bit about ultra thin silicon. If you take silicon and make it very, very thin, it's flexible. And this is a very interesting direction. And I'm going to show some examples. We don't do it, but we follow it because the major problem to make it, it costs few, uh, I would say you need a fab uh, to make silicon CMOS and it costs a lot of money. And uh, we don't have it in the university, but some uh, institutes like IMEC in, Be in Belgium and other places, it's an interesting technology, which I'm going to show you today. And sensor materials can be conductors, semiconductors, elemental, compound, conjugate, can be nanoparticles, core shell, everything in any shape and color and type, can be insulators and nanomaterials and interconnected packaging it's also don't forget once you make the sensor make the device the, i would tell you the most difficult part and i'm not joking is how to interface it with the rest of the world how to make the interconnected packaging i'll tell you my students struggle they make beautiful flexible sensors they put them on plants on leaves and then how to connect it to the computers. You have to make all these itsy bitsy tiny wires and make the interface and you have to invent an interface. And it's, like a, it's kind of a stupid problem, but it's a very serious problem. And these are the materials that we use. For example, uh, um, polymer for biosensor. This is the paper I showed you before. I showed you this application and they are using this uh, polysulfide network obtained via 3-ethylamine, TA catalyzed, thiol acrylate, click reaction between this very long name called material. Uh, so you can see that people are designing the special polymers to have some very special structure. So there's a lot of uh, material science involved in developing new polymers, new materials for flexible biosensors. Other materials, for example, if you want to make electrochemical sensors, you need uh, electrodes, uh, reference electrodes, metal, semiconductors, metal oxides are very common, zinc oxide, indium oxide, other materials, and more. It's a long list. So uh, here are more, some ex more examples. This is another paper published in 2017. This is a non-invasive sweat analysis. And this is one of my students one of my ex-students, she did a postdoc on this topic and she was working for a few years. And you can see you have a waterproof band, the kind of plastic, you have some glucose sensor, electrochemical sensor, pH sensor, humidity sensor. And for example, the glucose sensor includes silver chloride reference, platinum counter, porous gold, and the nafion uh, ionic polymer on top of it. And you, you can see that it's, this is a classical device material issue problem. And on top of it, everything has to be flexible. And I'm going to show you later what are the mechanical problems when you actually make this structure. Now I'm going to, I, I, this is, we don't do it, but I'm going to show you a little bit something which is really the got, it caught my mind recently because all this CMOS technology, you take a, silicon device and you just make it very very thin and because it's very very thin you can put 3d chip stacking mechanical flexibility ultra thin chips ultra thin chips and let me switch it's called by the way this technology called chip film it was published uh, first in 2009 but the idea you take a silicon wafer and just make it very thin this is it and 20 micron silicon you can see how between fingers, it can bend. You can uh, force it into radial structure. 
you can make it uh, with a mixed signal. In this is a complete integrated circuit. And this is the beauty of this technology. It's just very expensive to make yet. I mean, everyone is very cheap, but it, you need like four than hundred million dollars, I guess, at least to build the facility, sometimes more. But you can put a complete, on this area, you can have few millions of transistors and signals. So you can make the whole system on a chip with the electronics and everything. And you can make it, for example, this is, uh, they make it like a smart monitoring system with an RFID tag. And this is, uh, I would say, one of the technologies to follow. Uh, it's not as flexible as polymers. It says its own problems, but the advantage, you can put a lot of electronics. So you can think about this technology as, I'm sure people will find good applications for this. Now the materials. This is a review, very recent review that published this year. We talk about carbon nanomaterials, polymer materials, and other materials. And you can see the electrochemical sensor, gas sensor, DNA sensor, everything. People use nanomaterials, and I'll skip this slide. One of the advantage, and we work a lot in nanomaterials in my group. Uh, we develop zinc oxide and nickel oxide nanomaterial-based electrodes together with Professor Salva Mirabella from the University of Catania. You, this is a classical electrochemical sensor. You put nanomaterials on top of it, but then you bind to them. For example, you bind antibodies, to, anti, antigen to detect, uh, to do, uh, this is for example, the ELISA chip. So you can use carbon nanotubes, graphene, uh, indium tin oxide, nanowires, metallic nanoparticles. We use a lot in my group, indium tin oxide and zinc oxide and nickel oxide. And we bind to them all this biological material to make the sensors. And the advantage of nanomaterials that you can, a very large surface area, very small size, you can use them as a binding post for all this bio biological material. Uh, I will not go through all details of this slide. I just want to show you a few more slides before I'm going to the rest of the talk, a flexible integrated sensor array for multiple per perspiration. You can think, and you can see that practically all the devices, they have these electrodes and they integrate them. This is a glucose sensor of the electrodes and you sense it. You, this is a biofuel cell. <laughs> They actually have, all of them have similar structures. And uh, this is another example of a, a schematic illustration of a, the process. Here they use iridium oxide, hemin, titanium oxide, biosensor. This kind of structure, they also put the nanomaterials and this is the cell. And I think I, this is my last example and I just show it because this is something similar to what we do. We do a lot of electrochemical sensors. So naturally, this talk, I will give you more examples on electrochemical sensors, but I don't want you to get the wrong impression. There is a lot of work on optical sensors and other sensors. Just because of the limited time, you talk about the electrochemical sensors, we want to do uh, something like electro uh, like uh, cyclic voltammetry and measure the, again, I'll skip this slide and let's talk about, let's go now about something more specific about flexible electrodes. As I told you before, you need the flexible electrodes for two major applications. One, there's a whole part of what we call electrochemical sensors. You need flexible electrodes. But even if you make uh, optical sensors and other sensors, you need interconnect to the optical devices. You need the interconnect part, and the interconnect, they have to be also flexible. So you use polymer substrates, conducting electrodes, and the reference electrodes. And we have a lot of problems. Delamination, adhesion of the materials, cracking is a big problem. And today I will talk a lot about cracking. And Metal on polymers. It's very easy to say, I put metal on a polymer, and I'm going to show you the problems. There's a lot of work, like gold nanoparticles and polyester, cracks in gold and PDMS that was published. You can see that even 17 years ago, people talk about the problems. And the idea, you put metal on polymers. And today, I'm going to talk about metal on polymers for biomedical sensors. 
So the challenges are the following. First, the patterning issue. Since we deal with structures which have can change their shape, also they can be non-planar. Now, the problem here is most of the people use projection lithography. They use photolithography to pattern microstructures. The problem is that they are using a projection systems and they have a big problem of defocusing, which means you cannot do lithography on a non-planar structure. You have the issue of the photoresist. When you do photolithography, uh, the idea is practically you make your design, you take a big camera, you are project your image on the device, and you do the process. The problem is that uh, all the lithography is using polymers, and your substrate is also a polymer. And it's also very difficult to make the compatibility that one material will not affect the other material. So the there's a lot of patterning issue in flexible sensors. It's very complicated to do the pattern. It's very difficult to do polymer substrate and a polymer lithography. You have material problems, material with different families, like metal on polymers, and you have a big mismatch in material physical properties that might cause very big reliability issue. So what are the solutions? What are the research frontiers today in making flexible electrodes? One is metal printing. Can we do a metal inkjet? All of you, or most of you, have an inkjet printer, but you're in, you are uh, printing ink. Can we print metal ink? Can we use conductive polymers, carbon nanotubes, graphene? Our, and our presentation is uh, metal on elastomers, which is what we discussed today. So our process, what we develop in Tel Aviv University in collaboration with the University of Milano, is flexible electrodes using femtosecond laser ablation on thin metal films and polymers. So uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm switching from the large overview of the field of, uh, until now I gave a, a 35 minutes of review of the field of flexible electrodes. I describe all the materials and in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about what we do, how we solve the problems. And uh, one of the biggest problems that everybody faces is metal failure due to cracking. And next we show that patterning flexible electrodes using femtosecond laser ablation and the origin of the crack. Is in order to solve the cracking, I, I will explain you why there is cracking and how to avoid the cracking, how to make reliable sensors. So first, one of the technologies which is very promising now and many people doing it and we have we bought this system a few years ago we are taking a laser and this is a femtosecond laser we're using the 343 nanometer wavelengths which is ultraviolet we're using pulses approximately 270 uh, femtosecond pulses we have a galvo scanner so we can scan with the beam and we use a uh, uh, First, we prepare the substrate, then we do surface treatment cleaning, then we put the metal, and then the laser beam is ablating the, the, the metal. So I'll go quickly. First, we take the PDMS. PDMS is the polymer, is an elastomer. And the way just, I just, it's not going to be a class in material science, but the way to make this polymer, you buy cross-linker, you buy the monomer, you mix them together, wait 24 hours, you have the polymer. So we can control the composition. For example, 1 to 10 is very very used, very much used, but I'm going to show you later that this, the reason I'm showing you this slide, because we can control the mechanical properties of the polymer. And this is going to be a big, big issue. Next, we clean the surface, oxygen, plasma, Next, we put titanium and gold on top of it. This is the, of our, our, our new evaporator. And then what we do, we take, we, you have a substrate with gold and on titanium on the polymer, and the laser beam is ablating the polymer. And the nice thing is the following. In this wavelength, the PDMS is transparent, but the gold is absorbing. So we can pattern and because it's a femtosecond, uh, the, there is no heat diffusion. And because it's a very short time, 
It's a very short pulses. The pulses are, in the, as I told you, it's about 270 fem femtosecond pulse. So because the time is so short, we have a, a huge electric, we have a, a huge uh, energy density per unit area. So the ablation sometimes is so fast, so the rest of the substrate does not heat. And because of that, we don't have a damage to the polymer under it. I'm going to show you later the structures. Uh, practically, uh, let's focus on this part. The, the, in a, we, we, if, we, if you have a nanosecond pulse, this is the laser pulse, you have, you're hitting this structure and the heat, this is the red zone is propagating. If you have a femtosecond pulses, you are ablating the material, but the heat is not, because the time is so short, the diffusion length of the heat, which is square root of D diffusion, diffusivity times time is so small, it's maybe a few angstrom, so there is no heating, only ablation. And because of that, we get much, much cleaner cut and much nicer structures. And the first generation, we, this is the structure, golden titanium and PDMS. And I'm showing you, to show you a very important issue. The material, they have their hardness. The, the young modulus, sorry. The young modulus of gold is 80 and thermal expansion is 14.2 ppm per degree Celsius. The PDMS is 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus three. You see a huge mismatch in the young modulus, in the mechanical properties. And you can say, ah, this is very soft material, who cares, nothing will happen. This is gold, gold is strong, gold is hard. This is a mistake, and I'm going to show you later. So what we got is this is the electrodes we make by the laser. You see this is very clean definition. These are the pads, one, two, three pads. These are the working electrode. This is the auxiliary here. This is the reference electrode. And this is after we cut it and clean it and we use it. And we put the three, you see the in, this is student's interface, three crocodiles. You can do better. The problem is, when you look very close, this is what you get. When you deposit gold on PDMS, this is what you get. On regular PDMS. You can solve this problem, don't worry. It's the new generation, this, is the, this was the first generation. So we say, oh, what should we do? Different deposition method, different materials, maybe change profession. No, so one issue, we say, let's try to see if we have another technique. So we looked at another, we have a laser, and there is a technology called lift. And lift is the following. You take, you take the glass, you, you put a glass, on the glass you put the metal. And then you are illuminating from the back side with a laser. And because you illuminate, you illuminate it from here, you are generating a drop and the drop is going down and deposited on your substrate. So you go to a different point and deposit another drop and then deposit another drop, and then you can make an electrode. So this is called lift, and because we have a laser, and you're the, taking your substrate, it's called a donor, and from the donor you are generating metal drop. This is like an inkjet printer, but instead of having a cassette, we have a substrate of glass with gold, and we can we put drop, 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 we can put hundred and more than 100,000 drops per second, and you can put many drops, you can take the many beams of the laser, so you can work very, very fast. And this is a commercial product. There is an Israeli company called Orbotech. They make this device and they actually very useful devices. So this is how it looks. These are the electrodes on the soft polymer on PDMS. And this is how it looks. You see no cracking, no nothing. It's really get very good results. But you know, every, in, we are university, anytime we solve a problem, then we look for another problem. We still have this problem of cracking of the normal process. So we clean, we etch, we catalyze the seed, we do electroless plating on top of it. And electroless plating on top of it solve a lot of the problems because uh, we can do some combination of a softer material, but we still had some cracks. This is electroless deposition. And by electroless deposition in PDMS, you see we got no defects, but we still want to understand why we get cracks in the old problem. 
because we really like the, to do evaporation on plastic because it's really it's commercial technology so we looked at the uh, modulus of tungsten as a definition of the crosslinker you remember how we make this polymer we take a crosslinker mix it with the monomer heat it wait and we look at this table and we saw well we can control the young modulus of the polymer between 1 to 10 megapascal by controlling the crosslinker and let's see what happens and surprisingly when we do 1 to 2 ratio no cracks we still have wrinkles but no cracks 1 to 19 ratio we got beautiful cracks so we want to understand why how comes how come this very soft polymer with the model young of 10 to the minus 3 gigapascal is breaking making cracks for the gold which is more than 10 gigapascal so we took the structure oh, this is another experiment we put some uh, we, we, we say we, we try to be smart so we put between our polymer and the and the metal we put another polymer called par parilin with the modeling of one which can between 80 to this ah, still got the same crack so we say we need to solve this problem so what we do we are engineers we do mechanical analysis i will not give you the whole structure but we are taking we are doing all the calculation of the forces in the structure and we write a code everybody can use it we published this in the paper recently uh, that we can calculate the stress in this material and we because we want to deal with more than one layer we develop it this can be polymer metal polymer metal so we, we solve it for multi-structure and then we apply this solution to our which we solve we calculate the stress in our materials so this is stress versus depth this is a pdms about five microns and as expected the stress in the pdms is very very small you see it's uh, less than 10 megapascal but then to our surprise we got in the gold a stress of 300 more than 300 megapascal huge stress on the gold which we did not expect it and what we found out that pdms is a very soft material but it's uncompressive it's not compressible and the problem is is the gold and the pdms have different coefficient of thermal expansion so when you heat them and cool them the pdms is applying a huge force on the gold and this is gold this is the cte of gold this is young modulus of gold this is the post one ratio so we this is the problem PDMS is a huge coefficient of thermal expansion. So we need to reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion of the polymer. So one option is to switch to Kapton. It's less flexible, but with much, much less coefficient of thermal expansion. And we did again the calculation and found out that for Kapton, the pressure, the stress is only 13 megapascal. And the stress dropped significantly. And just to give you the mechanism of cracking, if you have a PDMS, you put on top of it the metal, and when the metal, when the device is cooling down, this is applying a force, and you have this something called wrinkling. It's a no, it's a nonlinear phenomena, and this is the critical stress for wrinkling. If this is taken from a textbook, and these wrinkles, when they they break here on the on the bottom of the of the metal. And this is the critical stress for PDMS is 0.2 and for Capton is 18.9, which means first, what we found out that if we deposit it on Capton, no cracks, no nothing, or alternatively, we change the composition of the PDMS to increase the young modulus of the PDMS and to reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion. And then we solve the problem. So we developed a whole system to make, not only to make electrodes, but to analyze when they are break, when they don't break. And we have a table, everybody that want to use metal X on a polymer Y, we can predict beforehand if it's going to crack or not. So this is our contribution that we can, we can forecast for any combination of any metal that we know the properties, if it's going to crack or not to crack. So this is our conclusion and the origin of the metal film cracking is the difference in the coefficient of thermal expansion 
And also the elastomer is soft, it applies enough stress, and Kapton can serve as a substrate for flexible, flexible interconnects. And a combination can be, a, you do a Kapton substrate, and then on top of it, PDMS and then metal. And the femtosecond laser ablation is a, is a good technology. And thin film stress analysis is a very efficient tool when developing components that are assembled of the different types of materials. The last topic I want to talk today is a, a very new technology, which is extremely, I think it's a very promising, and it's a combination of nanoparticles and PDMS. And the idea is the following. This is called supersonic cluster beam deposition. There are a few systems like this in Europe, and we had a huge research program with University of Milano, a Catholic University in Leuven, and University of Birmingham, and other universities. And because they have the tools, we don't have the tool in Israel, so they make the devices, they make the samples for us. We focus on biomedical devices, and the idea is you take a, a source which is called cluster source, and you are generating nanoparticles of metals. And these nanoparticles can be one or two nanometer in size. You ac accelerate the nanoparticles, and you shoot them into your PDMS. Remember, PDMS is your flexible substrate, and you want to make the flexible device on the substrate. So you put gold into it. And this is how it looks. This is a, a supersonic cluster beam deposition. This is PDMS, the polymer. And you can see, if you, if you implant enough gold, this is the PDMS with gold nanoparticle. It's a composite material, porous material. It's approximately 50% gold, 50% PDMS. But you can see that the gold, and you can even make more, make it more. And what happens? This is a very, very flexible material, and the gold nanoparticles with low energy and neutral electrical charge are implanted in PDMS. The nanoparticles concentration provides ohmic conduction together with PDMS stretchability, and. Uh, actually, there's a, even a company now in Italy trying uh, making and selling this technology. And the gold nanoparticles are synthesized by technology called cluster source. And a set of aerodynamical lenses are collimating the cluster beam, and the gold nanoparticles penetrate the PDMS matrix. And this is the constant. We can actually, uh, Professor Milani is measuring resistance is the actual thickness of the gold. And you can see that initially the resistance is very, very high. This is ohm centi. This is very, very high. When the gold film is approximately, this is 100 nanometer of gold. If you have less than this, the resistivity is huge. It's inf almost not infinite, but giga ohm and more. Above 100 uh, nanometer, the resistivity goes down from 1 kilo ohm centimeter to 10 to the minus 2. It, the resistivity goes down by 5 orders of magnitude. And you can use it, by the way, to measure position and to measure stress, and then it becomes like a gold deposition. So, if we deposit 200 nanometers, we can have a good electrode, and it's very, because it's flexible like PDMS and conducting, not like pure gold, but 10 to the minus two is a pretty good conductor. And again, we use gold, the, the laser processing. It's simple, no mask, no lithography. Students can do the design at eight o'clock in the morning and have the device at nine o'clock in one hour and test it. And this is the devices. And by the way, you can see here that we use the monomer and the PDMS with uh, a relatively high CTE, so we got cracks. But the good news, the cracks, we have gold, even though we have cracks, all the devices worked because we have, uh, the cracks are only on the gold on top of the PDMS. The gold inside the PDMS are still conducting. This is top view, this is the cross section. Uh, and this is how it looks. This is this is this is a better sample. This was the I showed you good good samples and also bad samples. This was the first run was a lot of cracks. Second run was actually much much better. And this is the laser processing. And we can go down to three micron lines. 
and you can see this is a three micron electrode. And this area here is called HAZ, heat affected zone. I told you there is no heating, but there's a little bit of heating. So this heat affected zone is about one micron. So we can make three micron electrodes. Usually we don't need such electrode. Most of the devices are 90 or 160 microns. This is how it looks. And uh, just to show you that we have a working devices, we make electrodes with different widths, measure the resistivity, and this is one over resistivity versus electrode width, and we proved Ohm's law. We proved that this is, uh, this is Ohm's law, resistivity proportional to one over the width of the device, and we calculate the specific resistivity, and you can see here is uh, for, it was about 2.6, 10 to the minus 3 ohm centimeter, which is excellent for electrodes. It's not good. Pure gold will be three orders of, three orders, uh, will be like uh, 4, 5, 10 to the minus 6. But this is like polysilicon, this is like indium oxide, this is like zinc oxide. It's pretty good material, pretty good conducting, and very, very flexible, really very flexible. So, to summarize this talk, and I promise Ragini that we'll be between hour to hour 15, so we are close to the end of this talk today. Uh, the interim conclusion about what we do is soft and flexible microelectrodes were fabricated by integrating a novel metallization and patterning process. And we can go down to three microns by laser microprocessing. And the microelectrodes fabricated by the supersonic cluster beam deposition and femtosecond laser have the conductivity to act as electrodes. For, we, we use it for plant sensing, but Professor Milani is using it for electrodes for the brain and electrodes for the skin. And uh, there's a, a lot of applications for this technology now being investigated. Now, if you summarize the whole talk, what I talked about it today, I started with overview the field, and then I showed you what we do. And we, we, we have other projects, but because of time constraints, I focused on our, what I would say the most hot topics. By the way, uh, what I showed you recently was accepted to the material conference that will... I'm, I'm going to show this presentation in October in the material conference in Europe. It was accepted for oral presentation, which is very respected because they accept, I think, one out of ten papers. Uh, so I, I'm giving you like a sneak preview on the MAM conference this year, the Materials for Microelectronic Conference. Um, and the other paper on the stress uh, was accepted to this, to this conference also, but uh, only to poster presentation. Uh, and the flexible, but if you go back to the topic I talked about it today, is flexible microsystem technology is available for biomedical applications. So if you need something, you can do it. You just need an access to a clean room and to manufacturing facility. Uh, in Tupper University, we don't have it. Uh, we are, uh, I'm also uh, visiting very often Beats Pilani uh, in Pilani and they have a very nice facility next to them where they can make nano electrodes. And I hope in India, uh, people will have more and more clean rooms, more facilities. India is a big country and uh, you should have a technology to make uh, f electrodes, flexible electrodes. Uh, there's a lot of technology, but also a lot of interesting science. What it includes, it includes electronics. I did not talk today about flexible electronics, but you can also do electronics. Actually, I talked a little bit when I mentioned the thin silicon but it also includes sensors and actuators. I did not talk today about actuators, but you can do drug delivery, uh, you can make um, ultrasound uh, transmitters, you can do some things. Optics, a lot of the sensors me measuring, uh, using light to measure, uh, to measure, to make a wearable device, even the, the watch I have in my hand has a monitor using uh, LED-based monitoring. Uh, there are many pro promises in biomedicine, and the number of, application, of, of applications sorry, is growing rapidly. And there are also a few commercialization successes. And the, uh, for example, one section 
of flexible, electro flexible sensors or flexible electronics is what we call biochips. And the biochip industry today is more than $20 billion. So it's, a, it's not a small industry anymore. And, but more research is needed, especially in new materials, nanoparticles, core shell, in their integration, how to put them, how to deposit them, how to make them reliable, reliability issue, and also, you know, if you want to put it in vivo or to make it wearable, it has to, has to, to, to make sure you don't, you don't cause any damage. So, there, so there is a lot of regulations about it. And packaging is also an important issue. So I would like to thank you and thank to my team and uh, this uh, presentation from the thesis of Tali Dotan, Yelena, which Ragini, I believe you remember Yelena and Itan Turjeman, this was their thesis. And this was supported by the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Science, Israel Science Foundation and the MANA Center for Global Challenges for Food Security. Thank you so much. Okay, this is the end of the talk. And okay. Uh, so thank you, sir, for this wonderful and very imperative and informative talk. I think all the participants benefited with this talk. So now I will ask some questions on behalf of all the participants. So the first question is from Utkarsha Srivastav. She asked, what can be the possible disadvantages of wearable sensors? Of what sensors? Wearable, wearable sensors. Wearable. Yeah. The advantages are clear. I mean, you can see, you can see me. See, I have the wearable device on me measuring when, uh, for at least. The, the advantages is continuous monitoring because you wear them, you can use it continuously. You don't need to come and disconnect. And because it's wearable, uh, companies are investing a lot of electronics. Like in the wearable I have here, you can think about it. You have the sensors, you have the pulse sensor, oxygen sensor. You have uh, all the electronics, uh, Bluetooth going to your cell phone, going to your physician. So the big advantage is continuous monitoring. By the way, the, there's a one disadvantage which people did not expect. And I, I hope, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, I have to check the truth, but I, one of my friends in America told me that when people start to have all these wearable watches, uh, many people are going to an emergency room with a panic attack. I mean, they say, my pulse is 180, I'm going to die. People, so, you know, the problem is people is misuse or one of the, and I'm, I will not call it disadvantage, but I would say one of the problems of wearable is education of the user, how to use this information. We are scientists, we are using to bed measurements, but many people take everything seriously and they should, but the main problem is, uh, the, 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 the main problem, and there's another issue of privacy of people. You don't want all this information to be on the, on, on the, on, on, on the cloud. So uh, if you suffer from something, your insurance, insurance will not give you insurance and the government will not give you treatment. Uh, 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 privacy is a big problem. Uh, you see, you know, this is like Facebook and all this. Once you have this innovation, you start to run into unexpected problems, which are social, not so, I'm not an expert in social science. Uh, from technology point of view, I think uh, the problem is uh, like any developing of a new me me measurement system. You want how to make it error free, how to make small false positive, how to make false negative, and to make it reliable. And this is a big challenge, which in many cases, I'm not sure can be solved. I mean, people have to, live with sensors, it's very difficult, uh, wearable, it's, 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 it's you're, you're wearing it in the morning, it's not done by a physician in a hospital or by a nurse, it's, you always have this chance of a bad measurement. So this is one of the biggest problems. So if we can solve it, if you, if you can make a wearable device with a 0.99995 error uh, or uh, correct, you will be a hero. This is a big challenge. Okay, sir. So the next question is, when we talk of wearable sensors, especially those that are inserted in the body to monitor a particular disease, do these sensors need to be manufactured to be personalized for that one person specifically? Excellent question. I would say you, this is, I, I, 
you know, this is so excellent question that I don't have an answer. Because this is exactly the problem. This is, these people are debating, people are asking, should we make it personalized? And you can do it personalized. You can think because of the laser printing, you can even do 3D printing. You can actually design a sensor. And we spend some time, for example, to, if, if, somebody, if a person has a tumor, we take the negative of the tumor and we can print a sensor which is exactly the size of the tumor and flexible. It can grow with the tumor or shrink with the tumor, hopefully. The problem with this is cost, efficiency, and again, how to make it right. And much easier to make a standard electrode. And uh, I, for example, the, another example, I know people which are developing electrodes for the brain, for the cortex. And the question, should I make a take, uh, can I make the electrode to fit exactly the fine details of the cortex, or can I make an electrode which is not exactly, but I have so many sensors can compensate by single processing? I, 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 I did not answer your question, but I just want to tell you that your question is the one of the challenges for flexible electronics, and it's also a conceptual challenge. How, what, what direction to go? Okay, sir. So next question is from Sukhmani Dua. Do these variable sensors, basically the inserted ones, can have some side effects or body can take it as foreign body and can respond showing some side effects? Yes, uh, definitely. And we are afraid of this. And definitely, thank God there is FDA and regulations. And uh, I, I believe you can have, an, like any implantable, you have the mechanical effect, you have the biological effect, you have the chemical effect. And we have to be very careful. It's very easy or to monitor to short-term effect. But it's sometimes questionable and problematic to identify long-term effect. You don't want to implant something and to fund this is a disaster after five years. This is going to be, it's a, it's a big problem. It's a big issue. And I... I think uh, this will be solved if we will be better information exchange between uh, countries, between uh, FDA and other places. We want to make if somebody in other countries has a problem, we want to know it beforehand. It's very important to distribute the problems also. Universities are usually doing it very well, companies not always. But I, 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 I think this is a big, it's going to be a big problem. It's, it's okay, a big sir. problem. It's a big problem. So next question is from Arsureka. She is asking, do the variable sensors leeches inside our system after or during its time of validity? Usually not. Leachable is a very... Uh, we try to make it from materials which will not leach. For example, my first sensor was silicon in the blood we made some sensor for implantable device into the heart, and then we found out that silicon is ate by the blood. So it's not leaching, because we usually make the sensors from materials which are inert. Like if you make gold electrodes, gold will not dissolve in the body. Uh, or if you make a polyimide, it will not leach. We are worried about fouling, about interaction, side reactions, uh, if I can try to understand your question, leaching it will be related if we do drug delivery and we have some excess or something, but we are not there yet. But again, it's, it's a problem we have to, we try to solve it by using the right choice of materials. Okay, the so right sir, design. the next question is from Toshi Singh. She's asking, can the printed circuits be recycled or reused by any method? <laughs> Do you understand? Can we recycle the devices? Yeah. We try, listen, if it's personalized, we try not to recycle it. We try to make it personalized, and after you, we just need to make them, uh, we want to make them, uh, we want to make the waste uh, gracefully. We don't make, we don't, we, we don't want to make the, the waste material will cause environmental problems. Um, I don't think that physicians like to have uh, recyclable electrodes, and, and, and but you know, if you use EEG, I think even today EEG, they throw them away after you use them, even the cheap electrodes. 
Um, I don't know. Uh, I think that in bioelectronics, if it's implantable, I, I think it will never be recycled. <laughs> Outside, I'm not sure, but uh, I have to tell you one last thing. Um, my work in India, we make the sensors. Uh, we try to uh, invent them. We, we try to make them very cheap. We, we are looking for strategy how to make low-cost sensors. And microelectronic sensors are very cheap. The cost of the physician, the cost of the nurse, and the cost of the hospital is usually more. Is the microelectronics can be made very cheap. The, the, the people sell these electrodes at very high price and are making implantable device very expensive. But this is not because they are expensive, because they have to cover all the development, and it's a business issue. But recycling, I doubt it. Okay. Recycling of the final materials, yes. If you have gold electrodes, you throw them away, then you are separating the gold from the plastic and use the gold again. This is what we do. We, we, okay. re, we, 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 we recycle the materials after use. Yes, this is what we do. Yes. Okay. So, sir, the next question is from Archita Sharma. Mm -hmm. She's asking that uh, about polymer substrate, what type of polymers have been used? Natural or synthetic polymers? What is their modulus value of chosen polymer substrates? Listen, if I have time today to give you the list of all polymers, we, have, we are going to finish by 10 o'clock at night. There are so many polymers. And I, I try to, you see in my lecture, I put like soft polymer and hard polymers. <laughs> but this, and p some people synthesize the polymers. And, and natural polymers is an excellent choice. I, I know there's a very, one of the top group in the world in uh, Kotayam, uh, Professor Thomas and the other groups, there are some excellent groups in India. And I think uh, natural polymers is an excellent choice that should be pursued. Uh, Tissue-like polymers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Hardness from megapascal, uh, in hydrogels, it's even kilopascals, up to pol Capton, which is two giga. Uh, it depends on the application. If you put sensor for the bones, you don't need it to make very soft. If you want to sensor for the skins, you make it uh, 100 or 10 megapascals. You can, the beauty of polymers, you can tune their strengths and hardness and surface and everything. They're wonderful materials. But again, I cannot give you an answer about what is the most popular. I would say that PDMS is popular, polyimide is popular, nylon is popular, and there are many other popular. SU8 is polymer, PMMA is, yeah. <laughs> again, I, I will stop here. Okay, so the next question is from Dr. Santosh Patra. He's asking whether any sensor to identify COVID-19 virus? Oh, there are many sensors. I think I can point today on 10, uh, many people develop sensors. Even now, we also develop sensors for COVID-19 because we had, a, in the last few years, our zinc oxide the nanoparticle polymers, we developed a sensor to, for RNA and DNA. We had a project for uh, detecting DNA and RNA in mycoplasma in milk with Italy. And it's very easy to translate it to COVID-19. To make a sensor for COVID-19 or like any other virus, once you know the protein or once you know the DNA, you can either make a sensor for the protein or sensor for the DNA, RNA. And they're very specific. and. You can make, you can do RT-PCR, which is expensive, but you can make uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, electrochemical, there are a lot of publications. I, I would say that making a sensor detecting viruses is not complicated. Uh, one of the problems of these viruses is the capsid. They, they are, uh, the viruses inside the capsid of protein, you need to uh, break it, but people know how to do it. Uh, to integrate it, everything on a chip, this is the challenge, and some people are pub publishing about it now. Now you take the sample, you break it, then you analyze it. And uh, people publish now, the recent publication now uh, from an American publication about uh, to doing it from the saliva. So the answer to your question, yes. Uh, what to do with it, I don't know. And the, of course, the regular issue, error rate. What is uh, false positive, false negative? 
But the answer, I think detecting COVID now is a problem which is technology possible. It's now how to make, how to reduce cost, how to make it more reliable. It's not that we don't know how to do it. We know. Okay, so next question is from Professor uh, Sudhir. He's asking, can we take out gold from waste printed circuit boards to make uh, gold pens? Yes. We to take gold from printed circuit boards to make sensors? Yes. I mean, this is what everybody, this is what we do also. This is the question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can, you, you can use, by the way, you can use PC. If you don't have a expensive facility, you can make beautiful electrodes using PC board technology. They're not so flexible, but uh, they're very low cost. And you can change the substrate if you can up, allow it, replace instead of using a, a FR4, which is the polymer, uh, the epoxy glass uh, composite, uh, change it for Capton and you can do it. You can take a PC board company and convert it to make uh, Capton based electrodes. We do it, we actually have a company in Singapore doing it for us. Okay, sir, so now I'm asking the last question for the session because of the time constraint. So this question is from Rajeshwari Thakur. She's asking, after insertion, does sensor contaminate with any type of microorganism? We, we try to avoid it. You have to, for implantable devices, there are very, very strict rules of uh, how to do it right. You don't want to implant it with contamination. So you have to follow regulations of implants. You know, this is a, you have to make it sterile. You have to do the everything according to the right way. I mean, I, if you're asking if to do, if to do it outside, like ambulatory treatment or in the field, this is a different issue. And there's a whole field of flexible technology that we have some effort in the, for the military, for defense. Because if you want to take care of a soldier in the field, you don't care about some uh, bacteria. You have a problem to solve, you solve the problem, then you send it back to the hospital, then it's taken care of. So there's, some, there's a whole field called emergency biomedical, emergency biomedicine, where you can compromise on the, I would say, on the cleanliness, because you need to solve the problem of injured person, accident or something. But this is, your question is an excellent question. It has to be regulated, has to be done in the right way. And uh, of course, if it, if it, everything has to be sterile, have to be right. Because every time you implant something, uh, the nightmare of the situation is that you have some pathogens inside. This is really, can be a disaster. So it's a good point that you have to make sure that all these implantable devices we work more not on implantable, we work on wearable. So this is less, you have the skin, so this is less dangerous. But your question is very, very, should be very, very uh, approached carefully and taken care of. Okay, so thank you, sir, for the very, very explainable answers. And I think all the participants uh, uh, have some benefit from this talk and your answers. So now I will uh, call upon Dr. Sitra Singh for vote of vote of thanks. Thank you, Ragini. Thank you, Professor Yossi, for again for wonderful talk and very informative uh, session. I hope everybody, including us, have enjoyed it. Just wanted to uh, share the news with you that next webinar from the Center of Excellence, we are planning it on 9th of October this year, 2020, at 11 a.m. It will be delivered by Head of the Department, Professor Sudhir Kumar. And the topic is very interesting because nowadays we are having lots of electronics in our daily life. So it will be electronic waste and healthcare. So very interesting topic. We will send you the link and all the details. So we will be meeting again on 9th of October. But before that, I want to share a few things, especially with Yossi, because Yossi, you already visited us many times here in India. We were with you for almost three years in Israel. And you know, uh, recently, uh, the 12 beautiful campuses of India, you have seen our campus, one of the beautiful campus of India, JP University is also being included in the top 12 beautiful campuses of India. And we are already having an MOU with Tel Aviv University. So that we are going to pursue for a longer period of time. And I'm sure your expertise and the 
expertise from Tel Aviv University and the whole Israel is always with us as an Indian. Being the JUITM, we are always uh, expecting positive aspects from your side also. So thank you very much for being with us, enlightening us with your excellent knowledge. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope to see you soon. Thanks.